Thanks, Matt, for helping me get over there. Let's appreciate that. That's usually what I do. <laughs> but today I'm going to be your speaker. And um, wow, Easter Sunday, I prefer to call it Resurrection Sunday, don't you? Um, Easter, I think, is a more of a pagan name, isn't it? Um, a, a pagan celebration. Uh, but they, uh, I don't know, I like the idea this is Resurrection Day. Now I'm going to say something and you can respond. He is risen. He is risen Amen. Very good. <laughs> he is risen indeed. For context, I'd like to turn to uh, Matthew 28, just to read the story briefly of the, the resurrection. Um, I'm going to tell you about a neighbor of mine and some witnessing we did, and then go into some of the four different reasons why the resurrection of Christ from the dead is so important. And there's more than four, but I'm picking four. I was sharing my message with Bill Gossett because he said he couldn't stay. And so we were talking about it. He actually thought of a fifth one, and uh, which is great. And um, so let's just read the story that is so incredibly significant in your life and mine. Starting at verse 1 of Matthew 28. Now, after the Sabbath... Uh, as the first day of the week began to draw, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the, see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning. Wow. And his clothing is white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid. Those guards were there. They were shaking with fear. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. Uh, I've always loved that scene. I can, uh, there's a Christian movie that has this scene in it. And this angel is coming in. like sounds like a missile coming in. I wish I could remember the movie. It's just something I've seen in the last year or two. And he stands there. He just throws the, the, the stone back, jumps up and just sits on it. And <laughs> like he's saying to this squad of maybe at least 16 soldiers what are you going to do about it and uh, you're wrong you're guarding an empty tomb i opened it up not for, to help jesus get out he's already risen but i'd open it up so you could look in and the women could look in and james and john and peter could look in and peter could run in and you know just to show you that god's son has risen from the dead and there's nothing you can do about it and uh, i i just have always liked that scene and, um, you know, I had a neighbor when I lived in Sugarland, Texas. I was there for about nine years ministering to the assembly there in Sugarland, Texas. And, um, and I lived within walking distance of the chapel. And we deliberately did that on purpose so we'd be close. And I get up in the morning and go for a walk and uh, get my couple miles in and inevitably as I was out somewhere I would be coming down the Austin Bluffs Parkway walking or somewhere in that area and I would hear in the distance hoo ya and it, that's what mil it's a military turn you know maybe you've heard it hoo ya and it was Lieutenant Colonel James um, Stark or Stearns excuse me and uh, we, inevitably we would stop and talk he would he lived three doors down from me and uh, I was telling him, he, and he knew what I did. He knew where I 
I was in part of the fellowship at that church and I'd invite him to things and he never came. And um, uh, by the way, just to get, bring his story almost to an end, his, his teenage daughter got off the bus one day and Alice happened to be getting the mail at the corner at our mailbox. And she walked back towards our houses together and she said, Courtney, why don't you come uh, to youth group sometime? And she says, oh, I will. And she did and began attending. And then there was a rally down at the football stadium at Reliance Stadium in those days. And uh, they, they presented the gospel. I think it was the Dare to Share conference. And she got saved. And so praise God. Alice simply says, Courtney, why don't you come to youth group? Of course, we had been in their house and she knew that we had talked to her parents and so forth. But this is one of those wonderful things for some people plant and other people water and God gives the increase. And so even though Jim Stearns, the Lieutenant Colonel, never responded to the gospel, his daughter got saved through our outreach. And I was thrilled with that. And by the way, Courtney's going on for the Lord. She's raising her family for the Lord. And we get emails from her all the time. Well, one of the things that Jim Stearns would do is he would, he would debate with me about the importance of the resurrection, the fact of the resurrection. And uh, he would give me articles from the newspaper that was talking about the Da Vinci Code. That was a big thing back in those days. You know, Tom Hanks was in the movie, several other movies. Basically, uh, the Da Vinci Code. Um, well, let me go on and tell you about the Passover plot is another thing. And uh, Passover plot says that, um, you know, the disciples drugged Jesus. And, um, and, and that's when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came and got, took him off the cross. He was still alive. They nursed him back to health, but they spread the story that he actually uh, uh, rose from the dead just to enhance Christianity. And, and that's the kind of stuff my neighbor would give to me. He talked about the Da Vinci Code. I don't know if you ever looked into it, um, but they're looking for the bones of Mary Magdalene because apparently she and Jesus got married and had a family. And uh, he can just stuff that sinful man. You know, Satan is trying to attack the core of the gospel. And what I'd like to show you this morning, what is the core of the gospel? Uh, what, there, there are two things that substantiate the claims of the Bible and the claims of Christ. And uh, two, the two things, uh, at least two things, but the two primary things are fulfilled prophecy and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Think about that, fulfilled prophecy. There are 224 prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus literally fulfilled. 224. And there are 109 about his second coming that will be fulfilled literally as we await the day of his return. Fulfilled prophecy. No other religion can claim that. They try to. I witnessed to a fellow I worked with one time. He was a Baha'i. And he talked about some of the incredible stories of their, you know, Baha'u'llah was their great prophet. And, uh, and so we witnessed as we worked in the evening sometimes, and um, I was practicing my homile I'm not, my apologetics on him, if, pardon me. And, um, but, you know, uh, it's, it's the world, is, Satan is coming up with everything they can to try to destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's important for you and I to know the gospel and to share it regularly. And uh, the second thing is the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And I'm going to show you this morning, Lord willing, in four important points, why we need to preach that and, and, and live as, as if it is true and tell everybody we can about the, the incredible fact that Jesus Christ is risen. This is Easter Sunday and the first day of the week. He, did, he wasn't in the grave three 24-hour days, but he was in, I think, Friday, perhaps. Some people think he was crucified on Thursday late, but I think it was Friday. Uh, Sabbath was coming, and they wanted to um, uh, make sure that uh, uh, he was dead before. And, they could, and so I think that's when he was 
um, I think he died on Friday, and um, and then he was buried, and then and then he came back to life on sometime Sunday early morning. Oliver Green, the great Bible teacher and uh, evangelist, says this. Listen carefully to this. The greatest bombshell ever to explode in the face of an unbelieving world was the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the unbeliever, the mystery of all ages is the empty tomb of Jesus. Apart from the resurrection, his life, sinless and spotless though it was, could never have saved us without him being risen from the dead. It is not his life and death alone that made salvation possible, but his bodily resurrection as well, Oliver Green. Let me give you a quote from William Smith, a well-known writer back in his day. William Smith wrote, the resurrection of Christ has always been categorically the central tenet of the church. All the evidence of the New Testament goes to show that the burden of the good news, the gospel, was not follow me or this teacher, then do your best, which is what religion tells you. The central tenet of the New Testament is but Jesus and the resurrection. You cannot take that away from Christianity without radically altering its character and destroying its integrity. That's how important the resurrection of Jesus Christ is. So Christianity has two things that, that no other religion can claim. That one is fulfilled prophecy. Can imagine how hard it would be for Jesus to fulfill 224 prophecies uh, from the Old Testament in his first coming. But he did. And he's going to fulfill the other 109 at his second coming. Imagine, you know, being risen from the dead. Um, stop and think of the proofs of his death, for example, the sword and spear into the side, crucifixion, and um, the, the horrible nails, eight inch long nails through the feet. And what that would do is, of course, you want to live, this the, the feeling every one of us has, we want to live as long as we can. So he would pivot on that nail and try to keep standing as erect as he can while being nailed to a cross. Because when you start to slouch, the pressure crushes your lungs and you can't breathe. And so you would force yourself back up to endure the pain. That's why they come along after a while and they break the legs so that the guy can't stand up and he's and it's over with. If they're in a hurry, uh, that's what they do. And uh, But if you deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are hopelessly lost. You, you cannot go to heaven. You need to understand who Christ is, the Son of God. You need to understand propitiation and the satisfaction of God's wrath towards sin. And you need to also realize that reconciliation back to God depends on the risen Christ and uh you cannot deny those things and go to heaven. And so we don't want to just, a uh, number of years ago, uh, there was a big brouhaha when I was a young man uh, going to, 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 to Bible school and uh, Campus Crusade for Christ developed a track called the Four Spiritual Laws. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Actually, it's been used effectively, I think, in some of their ministries. But it starts out that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And it doesn't really deal with the, the, the really essential things that we are sinners. And Jesus Christ died for that sin and he rose again from the dead. And so that would be up to the teacher then, or the one who was teaching the, the, the track to somebody to make sure that those things are, are said. So it was a big brouhaha that took place when I was in my late teens and early 20s. Um, why is the, this, the resurrection, the central tenet of Christianity. Why do we say that all are hopelessly lost who deny the resurrection? I'd like you to look at four basic tenets 
at least there's more than four, I'm sure, found in the New Testament about the revelation. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. So I want you to turn to these. And the, the first one is in Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one, if you would, please. Verses um, two through four. And I'm going to read starting at verse one and go to verse four. This is the first one. Uh, let me just read these scriptures to you. And then uh, I'll like, try to uh, open the, up the meaning of them. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. The word bondservant uh, was the lowest of slaves. He was the one who washed the feet of visitors who came. God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. And then later on when Joshua died, Joshua, my servant is dead. And Paul said, I am the servant of Jesus Christ. Look what Paul did. The great missionary to the Gentiles. He traveled three tri times throughout the Roman world. He led many people to the Lord, established churches in Thessalonica and Corinth and Athens and, and uh, the Galatian area. Great, great missionary, great preacher of the gospel. And, and he was beaten and robbed. He, in 1 Corinthians, I think it is, or 2nd and chapter 9 or so, he describes some of the things that happened to him. <laughs> he was beaten and imprisoned and you know, shipwrecked and slept out on the deep and... <laughs> You know, and, and those are just some of the things that happened to him, but he didn't stop. And those early apostles didn't stop. The, you know, uh, Roshan just came back from Kerala. Is that right, brother? <laughs> and uh, a lot of, Alice and I have a lot of dear friends in First Colony Bible Chapel <clears throat> in the Houston area who grew up in Kerala. And... Uh, that's the area where Thomas, the disciple Thomas went and established the gospel in churches. Wonderful. And, um, and it's still going on today. It's a, it's a tremendous testimony over there. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we take a look at what, what is going on here. And if we, I'm going to read these verses to you now. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, one sent on a mission, a missionary, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Now, here we go. Look at verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, there's his humanity, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God, there's his deity. So Jesus Christ is the God-man, fully God and fully man in one person. No one else has ever done that. No one else will ever do that again. That is who Jesus Christ is. He is declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So the Holy Spirit is saying, Look at, you know, he's of the seed of David. We can go back and do, the, do his genealogy like Matthew chapter 1 does or Luke uh, chapter 1, 2 does. We can follow his genealogy and show we can go all the way back to, to Adam or we can go all the way back to Abraham in the other one and show you his genealogy that he is the son of God, the son of David. But also uh, we take a look at the fact that uh, According to his flesh, he's the son of God. According to the spirit of holiness, he is risen from the dead. And that justified the fact that we can call him God. He is the son of God. He is risen. He is risen from the dead. And through him, we have received grace and apostleship and, uh, and so on. And so... This is a very important passage. Paul starts off with it in his, his, you know, Romans is basically his Paul's work of systematic theology. I think it's one of the most important books in, in the Bible myself, because he just goes through doctrine and doctrine and doctrine and not all of them perhaps as he could, but he, you know, 
uh, it's so important that we understand that when he, the fact that he is risen, the fact that the grave is empty, the fact that the angel came down and rolled that stone back and went up and sat on it and said, take a look. This, this you Roman soldiers, you think you're going to stop this? No, Christ is risen. And your lives are at risk because you've let your guard, the person you were watching, leave. And, and that's why the Philippian jailer, of course, took out a sword and was going to end his life because his prisoners, he thought, had left. And uh, he's, he wasn't afraid of those 16 soldiers. They were terrified of him. And it's empty. You look in. I opened the door, the, removed the stone back so you can look in. Do you see what's going in there? He's not in there. He's risen, like he said. And this proves his deity. <clears throat> it proves here in chapter one of Romans that he is the son of God. According to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, he is the son of God. Praise his name. And that is, that is something for us to keep in mind. When we witness to people, do we tell them that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? <clears throat> you know, um, one of the things I like to do when I'm witnessing to somebody is to simply ask them a question. <clears throat> do you have any spiritual beliefs? What do you believe? And I uh, ask them, who is Jesus Christ? And then you ask them, um, if what you say is not accurate, would you want to know why? Would you like me to show you in the Bible who he is? And if they don't, you, you leave them in the Lord's hands and somebody else may be able to witness to him. You don't debate, you don't argue, you know, but you share the fact that Jesus Christ, God's son, died for you. That's sin. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let's look at the second point. I'd like you to look at Romans 10, 9 and 10, which is one of my favorite gospel verses. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. If you confess, if you say it's true, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that what? God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Do you confess with your mouth and, your, and you believe in your heart that Jesus, the first point, is the son of God? Do you understand that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? One of my favorite ways of witnessing in the past has been the Roman road. You ever hear of that? The Roman road. Just, just take some into Romans and just follow this path from Romans 1, 16, the gospel, Romans 3, 23, 6, 23, 10, 9, and 10, and so forth, Romans 5, and show them from Romans who Jesus Christ is. I let a young boy, a young teenager, uh, Bill Gossett knows his parents, amazing, <laughs> from his days in San Diego. And this young man became a Christian one day at camp, came up to me and said, Jeff, I just don't know if I'm going to heaven. I just don't know if I'm saved. I was a speaker that week at Verdugo Pines. And so I sat down with them and I did the Roman robe with them. And I said to him, um, his name is also Jeff. <laughs> I said, Jeff, you just sit here and think about this and uh, talk to the Lord about it. And I, I said, I'm going to go down to the snack shack and have a Coke and wait for you to come find me when you're done. I went down there and um, he sat up there, him and the Lord. He's up there about, I don't know, 20 minutes. And he came down the hill, sat across from me on that bench, and he was just absolutely weeping. 
And I looked at him. I said, Jeff, do you know that you're saved now? He nodded his head and said, yes, I do. <laughs> uh, I don't often go into repeat after me type of scenarios. You know, they need to believe it in their heart. And so sometimes I've done it the other way, but I don't prefer that way. Who is he? Do you have any spiritual beliefs? Do you know that he is God's son? Do you know that he has risen from the dead? And do you know that you have to believe that? Or you can't go to heaven? So that the two essential elements of the gospel are to me, number one, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and two, that we have all sinned and fall short, and we need to preach the gospel, talking about sin and the work of Christ and resurrection from the grave. Let's take a look at what the early church did. Uh, take a look at Acts chapter 4, if you would, please. While you're turning, let me just say that I... Um, Acts 4 2. I have a Bible program on my computer. I actually have two of them, but the one I love to use is called eSword. I don't know if you ever hear of it, but I recommend it. And I looked up the word resurrection on eSword. It's found 41 times in the New Testament, the word resurrection. And um, 10 of them are in Acts. 25%, let's say, of the word resurrection in the New Testament are found in Acts. Why? Because those 11 men and Matthias saw him alive. And Thomas got down on his knees. He said, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my hand in the wounds. And Jesus appears in the room. He doesn't like the grave. He didn't have to have somebody open it for him. He didn't have somebody open the door for him. He came through the door or through the wall. And he came into the room. And Thomas drops to his knees and says, my Lord and my God. Wow. And someday you and I are going to see him face to face. And the early church preached the resurrection. You look at some of the great messages that took place in the book of Acts, some by Peter and John and others, Paul later on at the end of Acts, they used the idea of the resurrection over and over and over again in presenting the gospel. These men who ran away in the garden, these men who, according to church history, as, as much as we can count on church history, died I heard that Thomas was killed with a sword or a spear thrust through his chest. I don't know if that's true. Um, some of them were just treated horribly and died great martyrs' deaths. They didn't care. They were going to see the Lord again. <laughs> and they preached the gospel all over the world. And look at what Acts 4 2 says. Being greatly disturbed, these are the, the, the people like the Sadducees and the people in the temple. They are greatly dis, uh, concerned or disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That's got to be part of your gospel presentation and mine. And they were very distraught that they were telling people he rose from the dead. And they laid hands on him, and they, they, they beat him, and they ordered him to stop doing that. Look at chapter 4, verse 33. Acts chapter 4, verse 33. I'm going to go to 32 for context. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of these things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. Now look at this. And with great power. Great power. The apostle gave witnesses to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how important the resurrection is. It was the central tenet of the church. It was what the gospel, the apostles preached. It's what they believed and they preached. And great grace was upon them all. 
God blessed it. I tell you, we've got to use the word sin in our presentation of the gospel, the need. And we got to talk about the finished work of the cross. Who is Jesus Christ? He's the son of God. He died on the cross for our sins. And he was buried and he rose again from the dead. That's what, you're, that's what people need to hear. Then they may laugh at you. They may mock you. Don't give up. Because you want those, want those people to go to heaven. They've got to believe who Jesus Christ is and what he did at the cross. And they have to believe in the resurrection. And we've already been in Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man confesses and so forth. And, and um, tremendous verses that need to be part of your gospel. Mary Magdalene can't save you. <laughs> so when Tom Hanks gets down on his knees at the end and sits in awe because he's found the place where her bones are buried. Incredible that somebody would come up with that. And, and millions and millions of people would watch those movies and talk about them like my neighbor did. Throwing them at me like, see, what do you think of the Da Vinci Code? <laughs> well, Jim, your daughter's going to be in heaven one day because she believed in Jesus Christ and uh, him risen. Let's look at the third thing. Look at, look at Philippians 3.10. What does the resurrection, why is it one of the most important tenets in the early church and in the New Testament? Philippians 3, 10. I like, I like this passage. And um, I'm going to start at verse 8. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, therefore, says, I count, yet indeed I also count all things but loss. Everything I have gained in life, possessions, position, anything, family. I count them all for loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Now here, look at verse 10, <clears throat> that I may know him and what? the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead myself. In other words, if I'm going to rise someday. Wow. So the word resurrection is found twice in this book, in this chapter. The idea here is to know Christ, that I may know him. And not intellectually understand the fact that there was a historical figure named Jesus and some people have started a religion about him or something. It's not just historically or intellectually. When you see this word knowing Christ, it's experientially and personally. You, you, you're looking at Christ and you're going to have a relationship with him. By faith, by grace through faith, not of yourselves. You believe in him. And he's going to be an important part of your life. And you want, you want to have these, these, this relationship with him, power to live the Christian life by overcoming the world, overcoming sin daily, living a life that honors and brings glory to Jesus Christ. It comes to us from the resurrection, of the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus. So in other words, it's how, how do I live a successful Christian life? What is, how do we face these dark days in America? How do we face the, uh, the battle that the world is throwing at Christianity? They mock us. They try to outlaw us. They, they, they don't want us to be speaking. They censure us. Some people put little re reports of what God has done in their life on Twitter or something else, and only to have it removed. You know, why don't they want that out there? They hate him. They hate God. They hate Christ. And how are we going to do it if we are uh, 
treated so harshly by the world, we have to say, hey, my life doesn't count to me. It's, it's, it's his life. It's the relationship I have with Jesus Christ experientially, personally, not intellectually, but an experiential relationship with him. And that's why one of the main ways I like to share the gospel is, do you have any spiritual beliefs? To you, who is Jesus? If you were to stand before the open door of heaven one day, I mean, would, would they let you come in? What, what would they answer that? Saw a interesting, somebody sent me a video of Alistair Begg talking about that. And um, here's this thief. And he um, had cursed Jesus. He had lived a life of crime. We don't know what he had ever heard about the gospel. But somehow, as he watched Jesus, the character and majesty of, and glory of his person, something attracted him. And so this man says, he gets to heaven according to the story being told by Alistair Begg, and he stands before the, the door of heaven, and somebody says, why should we let you into God's heaven? What could he say? There's only one thing he could say. The man on the middle cross invited me to come. Think about it. The man on the middle cross said I could come. And that's what, you know, <laughs> Come, today you'll be with me in paradise. And that's what need, they, they, people need to be saved. They need the grace of God, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ in their life. Romans 5, 9, and 10 says, Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Being recognized, reconciled, we shall be saved by his life that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. We know it experientially. We live it every day. We know it personally. And dear friends, that power is available for you this morning. The answer for our everything, our needs, our families, the world we live in is found in Jesus Christ. And I want to look at one last one just really quickly. If you look at 1 Peter 1, please. Peter, the epistle of suffering and the grace of God. And um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses, verses 3 and 4. I'm going to go to, I start at verse 3. 1 Peter 1, 3. This is the fourth. We are, you know, he declares him to be the son of God. Number two. You, you, you know, it's just, you need to preach the resurrection to be saved, genuinely saved. Number three, resurrection power that you can know him and experience him and live with him personally and by faith with power to overcome sin in your life. And four, the resurrection of Jesus Christ brings hope for tomorrow. First Peter 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten, he has made us alive again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith. For salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I think I'll stop there for the sake of time. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead gives us a hope that no one else in this world can find. I think I picked that up in the first service this morning, didn't you? The resurrection of Christ, the hope that we have. You know, this world's not our home. I, I find myself saying it over and over again lately, last maybe last year or so. Lord, this world's not my home. Please come. We look forward to your coming. 
You know, the Apostle Paul promises a crown of righteousness to all those who love his appearing. You love his appearing? When I was a young man, getting engaged and ready to get married, I, I confess, I think like every young man, I said, Lord, I want you to come back today, but uh, <laughs> I sure want to get married. I sure, you know, and um, so I was not the most gung-ho on it. <laughs> uh, the older I get, um, the more I realize that, that the greatest hope we have is that someday Jesus Christ is coming back. And this world is going to keep going down. It's just not going to get better. I think we could take it, the things happening in the world today, and, and prove fulfilled prophecy about the day of the Lord out of Joel and out of, Old, of Isaiah and different places in the Bible. Daniel chapter 9. It, it, you know, just Daniel 7, Daniel 2. You know, the, just everything that we see happening just to me uh, excites me. Christ could be coming soon. And um, Eldon gave me a name. I don't know if you ever hear of a guy named Amir Sarfati or something like that. Um, so Eldon watches him a lot. And he uh, and I have now been, Alice and I have been kind of reading and turning him on the internet and some of his things. Uh, and a pastor named Hibbs out of uh, Calvary Chapel in California. It's just, an, it's exciting. I mean, there's a lot of people who believe that the coming of Jesus Christ could happen in our generation, maybe today. Are you ready? Do you know the Lord is your savior? Are you born from above? How about your family? How about relatives? How about neighbors? I'm glad that Courtney is going to be in heaven because my wife met her at a bus stop and said, why don't you come to youth group? We planted and God watered and God gave the increase at a, at a conference, Reliance Stadium in, in Houston. Young guy came up to me at camp and said, Jeff, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. Here's the Roman road. Why don't you sit here and talk to the Lord about it? No, none of this repeat after me stuff, which maybe has helped some. And, and friends, we need to share the gospel with people. Let's pray. Lord, uh, you know, we humbly bow before you this morning on Resurrection Day, the day that Jesus Christ, two, two millennia ago, rose from the dead. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for paying the price of our sins. We thank you that you are the propitiation for our sins and not only ours, but also for the whole world. And we thank you that um, by grace through faith, not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man could boast, we can be saved. <clears throat> we thank you that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts like, that he is risen from the dead, we can be saved. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for the finished work of the cross. And we thank you and praise you that you're still saving souls in these last days. There's still time for people to respond. Help us, Lord to love you and to love the gospel and share it with the people who we meet who don't know Jesus. And we'll give you the praise and glory in your worthy and precious name. Amen.